Hallelujah. Come on, come on. Hallelujah. This is the day of rejoicing. Israel, do I have any Israelites in the house? All right, all right. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. Leviticus 23, starting at verse 23, says, And Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, ye shall have a Sabbath, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation, and ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire to Yahweh. This is the day, Yom Teruah. It is called the Day of Trumpets. So do I have any trumpets in the house? Come on up here. To, up here. All right, we're going to start off with the blowing of the trumpets and just go for it. Okay. Two, three. <laughs> in prayer and the prayer for this day is going to be on the last page of the program the last page of your program if you are on phone or on facebook we thank you so much for joining us on this joyous day if everyone could stand okay uh, on this joyous day um if you are on facebook give us a shout out give us a shout out please so that we know that you are there okay Let's open up in prayer, everybody together. We will observe the mighty holiness of this day, for it is one of all and anxiety. There is your dominion exalted. On this day, we conceive you established on your throne of mercy, sitting in truth. We behold you as judge and witness, recording our secret thoughts and acts and setting the seal thereon. You record everything. Yea, you remember the things forgotten. You unfold the records, and the deeds written there tell your own story, for every man's signature is there. The great shofar is sounded, and a still small voice is heard. The angels in heaven are dismayed and are seized with fear and trembling as they proclaim, Behold, the day of judgment! For the host of heaven are to be arraigned in judgment. For in your eyes, even they are not free from guilt. All who enter the world, you cause to pass before you. One by one, as a flock of sheep. As a shepherd musters his sheep and causes them to pass underneath his staff. So do you pass and record, count and visit every living soul appointing the measure of every creature's life and decreeing its destiny. But repentance, prayer, and righteousness avert the severity of the decree. You are slow to anger and ready to forgive. You do not seek the death of the sinner, but that he return from his evil way and live. Even until this dying day, you wait for him. Perhaps he will repent and you will gratefully receive him. True, you as creator know the nature of man, for he is but flesh and blood. Man's origin is dust, and he returns to the dust. He obtains his bread by the peril of his life. He is like a fragile posture, as the grass that withers, as the flower that fades, as a fleeting shadow, as a passing cloud as the wind that blows, as a floating dust, and as a dream that vanishes. But you are living an all-powerful God and King. Lashana Tova, and may your name be found written in the Lamb's Book of Life, this Rosh Shalana. All right, now everybody be seated. I'm gonna just deviate for a minute. You know I can't resist deviating for a minute. You want to know what today looks like? 
Christians, a lot of times, want to know, what are you doing? Aren't these Jewish holidays? Well, I'll be quite frank with you. I've looked in my book. I've looked in the Bible. And there is nowhere that I have ever seen that this says this is a Jewish holiday. You see, Torah to us is what? God's teaching and instruction from Genesis to Revelation. And I read in Leviticus where he said that we are to come together as a holy convocation. Uh, let me give you a hot channel too. That was not an ask. Okay, that was not, if you have nothing better to do tonight, would you mind meeting me for dinner? Okay, <laughs> that was a command to his people. And you want to know why? You need to understand what these holy days meant. See, somebody rushing to get here. No, <laughs> because if you don't understand the shadow because remember, in the book of Hebrews, it says that these days are a shadow of things to come. Okay? So we are celebrating. We are in the shadow of the Most High right now. Understand that, okay? But a shadow is cast from something that is real. So if this is one of God's appointed times, don't you want to know what the time that is casting the shadow looks like okay you want to know what the real thing looks like so to do that in this season okay that we are in in revelation chapter 20 revelation chapter 20 all right we talked about judgment so i'm going to read two sets of scriptures one starting okay in revelation chapter 20 verse 1 and i saw an angel come down from heaven having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand and he laid hold on the dragon that old serpent which is the devil and satan and bound him a thousand years now here's the key a thousand is a i'll say a, a multiple of 10 how many days is it between, okay, Rosh Hashanah or Yom Teruah and Yom Kippur? 10 days. It's 10 days. That's why you pay attention to even numbers, okay, in the Bible. He cast them to the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till a thousand years should be fulfilled and after that, he must be loosed a little season. So we see a judgment. Remember, this is a day of judgment. Then I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Yeshua and for the word of Elohim, God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Mashiach a thousand years. See, when people are sitting around waiting for the rapture, and we're going to get into that, they do not understand that, yes, the dead in Christ are going to rise. And yes, we that are alive and remain are going to be caught up together with them. But see, in order to understand what goes on there, you go back to Revelation chapter 19, when Yeshua is coming from the clouds, we're going to meet him in the clouds, and Yeshua comes back on earth, and here we are, right here. You understand? And that's New Testament. However, the season begins today as Judgment Day. However, you have to understand that Judgment Day, there is a final sentence. Am I right? So the season that we are in, the season that is casting the shadow, okay, the shadow right here, I see it even right here, that is casting the shadow, but it actually winds up when the fullness of that shadow comes in. It is starting in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And that I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. All right, we're going to see this when we get into the study. The books were open. So there is a specific 
day that they know the books of judgment were opened. Okay, it says books, that's plural. That means there's more than one, all right? And another book was opened. So books meaning two, and another book, two plus one, oh, you must have passed math, okay? And another book was opened, which is the book of life the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to the works. And the sea gave up its dead which were in it. Hello, didn't we say there was a time the dead in Christ were going to rise? The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. See, going to hell, people are scared of going to hell. Hell in the Bible meant the grave. But according to this, there is something that even hell is scared of. Hell is not the worst place for you to wind up. You understand what I'm saying? It's because we were taught incorrectly. And so what Yahweh is doing now is correcting those errors so that you can see. Let me tell you something. I know there is no such thing as blind faith. Because Yahweh wrote out everything so that those could have it, that had an ear could hear and those who had eyes could see. And this is very plain. And it says, okay, in this, that was the second death. And then verse 15. This is why we say, may you be inscribed in the book of life. It says, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let me tell you, the Jews teach when it says, and the books were open, there is a book of the wicked. There is a book of the intermediaries. In other words, I can't decide whether I want to go to church or the club. <laughs> okay. I can't decide who I'm going to worship, either the Easter Bunny or God. Okay. You understand what I'm saying? So I'm kind of lukewarm. You understand what I'm saying? When you are lukewarm, you are neither what? Hot nor cold. And so this is very clear to say the books were open and then another book, the book of life. But it winds up telling us and informing us that whosoever is not written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. So let me say something to you. If you decide to be lukewarm, you've made your decision where you are going to wind up. Lake of fire, baby. Okay, hope you have an asbestos soup. Okay, this is gonna be hot down there. So let's go to our program. Let's look at some of the themes and idioms in the Bible. Why is this important? Because we always forget that the Bible was written by Jews. So it was written by a people who had a particular culture. So when they said certain things, all those people within that culture automatically knew what they were talking about, okay? So I didn't have to give the specific name because how many times do we hear, well, he in the New Testament, well, he never said we had to do thus and so, so we must not have to do it. No, you didn't understand the, who is this tall person coming through here? Okay. Uh, oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> I remember him when he was a little kid. Marcia, you getting so old. <laughs> So anyway, let's go over some of those names and some of those themes. We're on the uh, second page of the program. Yom Teruah, which is the day of the trumpets, Rosh Hashanah, okay, which means head of the year, okay? So understand something. Tonight begins a new year. This is the sixth 
day of creation when Adam was created. And Adam was created and he was what? Put in the garden to do what? Work. So this begins a new work year for you and the fruit of your hands. You understand what I'm saying? So your, your work year begins now. Okay, so it's very important to understand that. Remember, we talk about the three timings that we have to pay attention to. Yeshua gave us a hint. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar. Render unto God the things that are God, right? So Caesar has a time that begins from January to December. So the things that concern Caesar must be done within Caesar's time frame. Now, the prophetic year or year representing our freedom, okay, where God begins to mark his timetable on how he deals with his people in a certain way, begins the month of Beeb, which is usually in the March or April time frame. So that is the prophetic year. So when you are reading from Exodus to the end, and it says the third month, that means the third month after the month of your freedom. You understand? That's how you count that. All of the prophetic timings are based upon that. When he says in Exodus chapter 12, verse 1, this is to begin the beginning of months. He didn't say year. He said months to you. The new year changes based upon Adam because what does time mean to a turtle? <laughs> okay, I'm, well, I'm kind of I'm not kind of slow today, turtle. You're always slow. Okay, so time means something to a man, and it marks the timing of man. So the things that you do are based upon this timing right here. So going back to the themes, teshuva, a time of repentance. Why is this a time of repentance? Because between now and Yom Kippur, you got 10 days to get it right. The gates are open. Amen, amen. Ooh, wow, wow, wow. Anyone name that hurricane? Okay. <laughs> we have Rosh Hashanah, which is the head of the year, or the birthday of the world, because once again, based upon the creation of Adam. So if this is the sixth day, this past week has been day from one to six. And so a lot of things we've been in planning and planning and planning and planning to get ready to implement, okay? Yom Teruah, day of the awakening blast, the feast of trumpets. So when you see, for example, in Matthew chapter 25, you have the 10 virgins, right? You have five that are wise and you have five that are foolish. And all of a sudden, the trumpet blows and here comes the bridegroom, okay? So that day, okay, is representative of that in Matthew chapter 20, 24, this day rather, or rather 25, okay? Yom Hadin, the day of judgment. Guess what? There's a sentence going on right now. And guess what? Book of Job, where you been? I've been all around looking at uh, Brad Marcia. Okay, just to name a few, Hebrew Institute, you know, Sierra Leone, uh, nothing important, okay? Have you, I already considered them and got a plan, okay? You understand what I'm saying? It's a day of judgment. Now, understand something. Satan is the executor of God's judgments. People don't understand when you see him, you need to be asking why, because he is on assignment. He does nothing that he has not been given permission to do. And when you violate God's law, day of judgment, charges are rendered and he gets to execute judgment. Have you considered my servant Job? Yes, I have. He only serves you because of ba 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 ba. He brings charges, and then what does Yahweh do? He says, "Go, judgment entered." You understand what I'm saying? All right. 
Let's go down. Hamalek, the coronation of the Messiah. All right. And we see that all through the kingdom of God parables where the master goes or the king goes and comes back at a specific time and all the subjects come up and present themselves to him. That's this time right now. Did you know that right now, within these next few weeks, going all the way through the end of Tabernacles, that you have a personal meeting where Yahweh himself is going to be judging the works that you have done for the last year? I want you to think about that. Okay, master goes off, king goes off. He gives talents. Then he goes off. Then he comes back and he asks for an accounting of what he has placed in your hands. You understand what I'm saying? Stop shaking, Marcia. <laughs> Is Yom Hazikaron the day of remembrance or a memorial? All right? Sometimes we wish God would forget. Okay? The time of Jacob's trouble or the birth pangs of the Messiah. When have we heard these are the beginning of birth pangs? Matthew chapter 24, the beginning of sorrows is the beginning of Jacob's trouble, which is starts around a, a uh, Rosh Hashanah or Yom Teruah. Then it is the opening of the gates. The gates are open. When gates are open, remember we talk about, oh, God's going to give us a door that no man can close. There is an appointed time when the gates are open. Gates are open to let people in. If you don't get in by the time the gates are closed, it's too late. I want you to think about when you were a teenager. You better be back here before that light comes on. That's my mother. Before that light, I'm riding my bicycle feverishly. You would have thought I was the flash, okay? Sometimes trying to get in before that light comes on. You will block away and you shoot a rock to put the light out, okay? Because if that door was locked, you were really in trouble because then you had to ring the bell so you knew what you were going to meet when mama opened the door, okay? So the gates are open. Kiddushin Nesuin, the wedding ceremony. Hello, Matthew chapter 25. The resurrection of the dead. I put in here rapture just for some of you that are still having your bags packed. I know what you have in your closets, okay? But it is the time, the resurrection of the dead. We know that from 1 Corinthians 15 and also in Thessalonians, that there is a time that the dead in Christ are going to rise, that we are alive and well, will be caught up together with him. The last trump, and at the trump of God, the dead in Christ shall rise. This is today, guys. I sent a, a, a message to uh, Sierra Leone. I said, oh, by the way, all of those of you who are hoping on the rapture, if you are reading this text, you've been left behind. <laughs> okay, that should give everyone a scare. All right. Yam Hakaseh, the hidden day. Why is it the hidden day? Because what did Yeshua say? No man knows the day or the hour but my father in heaven. Why? Because this is the only one of the feast days that occurs on the new moon. The only one that occurs on the new moon. So you can kind of calculate it. You can know the time or the season, but you don't know exactly when that new moon. You go out and you see the new moon. We look for the new moon, right? Well, it was already shining by the time you got out there. So you're late. If you're watching and seeing the new moon, you've been left behind. <laughs> okay. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, with that. So we're going to go uh, through the rest of it. Um, would you come up, Rich, and you can read uh, Rosh Hashanah, and then we'll have our other readers uh, assigned for the uh, rest of the readings. Rosh Hashanah. 
the head of the year or birthday of the world. Rosh Hashanah marks the Jewish New Year and is part of the season of repentance. Rosh in Hebrew means chief or head, and Shana means year. Rosh Hashanah is the head of the year in the civil calendar and is also known as the birthday of the world since the world was re created on this day. Talmud Rosh Hashanah 11a. Tradition believes that Adam was created on this day. Mishnah Sanhedrin 38b. How did they decide? This was the day the year of the, the year of the world was created? Because the first words of the book of Genesis, Bereshit, in the beginning, when changed around, read Aleph B Tishri, or on the first of Tishri. Therefore, Rosh Hashanah is known as the birthday of the world, for tradition tells us that the world was created then. The time of observance. Rosh Hashanah is observed for two days. It comes on the first and second days of the month of Tishri, usually September or October, which is the first month of the biblical civil calendar. The month of Tishri is the seventh month in the biblical religious calendar. This may seem strange that Rosh Hashanah, the new year, is on the first and second day of Tishri, the seventh month on the biblical religious calendar. The reason that Rosh Hashanah is the seventh month in the biblical religious calendar is that God made the month of Nisan, Abib, the first month of the year in remembrance of Israel's divine liberation from Egypt, Exodus or Shemot 12.2 and 13.4. However, according to tradition, the world was created on Tishri, or more exactly, Adam and Eve were created on the first day of Tishri, and it is from Tishri that the annual cycle began. Hence, Rosh Hashanah, is celebrated at this time. Why is Rosh Hashanah two days long? Unlike other festivals that are celebrated in the diaspora, which is the dispersion, referring to those who live outside of the Holy Land of Israel, Rosh Hashanah is celebrated for two days because of uncertainty about observing the festivals on the correct calendar day. Rosh Hashanah is the only holiday celebrated for two days in Israel. As with all other festivals, the uncertainty was involved in a calendar that depended on when the new moon was promulgated, designated the beginning of each new month by the rabbinical, rabbinical court in Jerusalem, Yerushalayim, in ancient times. The problem of Rosh Hashanah is heightened by the fact that it falls on Rosh Kodesh, the new moon itself. Therefore, even in Yerushalayim, it would have been difficult to let everyone know in time that the new year had begun. To solve this problem, a two-day Rosh Hashanah was practiced even in Israel. Creating a two-day Rosh Hashanah was also intended to strengthen observance of each day. In the rabbinic view, the two days are regarded as a yam ark arika, one long day. Thank you, Rich. Rosh Hashanah, the wedding of the Messiah. The Bible is a marriage covenant, both of the Tanakh, the Old Testament, and the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, describe how God, through the Mashiach, Messiah, the bridegroom, is in the process of marrying his bride, the believers in him who will ultimately live and dwell with him forever. God ordained and established marriage and its divine sanctity in the Torah, the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, a bare sheet, when he brought Adam and Eve together to become one flesh, Genesis 2, 21-24. In so doing, we have a vivid foreshadowing of the Messiah being married to those who would believe upon him. Let's examine this closer. Adam is a type of Messiah Yeshua. Adam was made after the likeness of Yeshua, Romans 5, 14. Yeshua Jesus was made in the likeness of Adam, 
Philippians 2 and 8. In fact, Yeshua is called the first Adam, 1 Corinthians 15, 45 through 47. In Genesis 2, 21, God had a deep sleep fall upon Adam. Sleep is synonymous with death, Daniel 12, 2, John, a yoke 11, 11 through 14. And in Genesis 2 and 21, God had a deep sleep fall upon Adam. Sleep is synonymous with death. Corinthians 15, 51 and 54, Ephesians 5, 14. The deep sleep that God caused to fall upon Adam is a picture of the crucifixion and death of Yeshua as Messiah ben Yosef. God brought forth a deep sleep of an Adam so that he could take a rib from the side of the flesh. This required the shedding of blood. This is a picture of Yeshua who was pierced in the side of his flesh, shedding his own blood when he hung on the tree. John or Yochanan 1934. From the rib of Adam, God made Eve. Likewise, but likewise, by the death of Yeshua and faith or immunai in him, God established the assembly of believers known in Hebrew as the Kehilat. The believers in the Messiah, his bride became wedded to him by faith, immunai. This marriage can be seen in the Tanakh or the Old Testament, as well as in Jeremiah 23, 5 3, uh, through 6. It is written, this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord, our righteousness, Jeremiah or Yeremiah 23, 6. In Jeremiah 33, 15 through 16, it is written, this is the name wherewith she, uh, she, shall call, she shall be called, the Lord, our righteousness, Jeremiah 33, 16. So from these passages in Jeremiah, we can see that a wedding has taken place. Therefore, by accepting, trusting, and believing in Messiah, the bride of Messiah, his followers become one with him. These people would include both Jew, Hebrew, and non-Jews, Gentile, who have lived since Adam and will include Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, David, Solomon, as well as the prophets. God gave the wedding customs, service, and ceremony to the Israelites, Romans 3, 2, and 9, 4 to teach us about the Messiah Yeshua, Colossians 2, 16 to 17. With this in mind, let's examine the biblical wedding ceremony that God gave his people. The ancient Jewish wedding ceremony God gave to his people to teach us about the wedding of the Messiah consisted of 12 steps. Shalom, Israel. Shalom. Praise Yahweh. Praise him. The marriage supper of the Lamb is revealed by the Hebrew wedding ceremony. There are 12 steps. First, the selection of the bride. Step two, a bride price was established. Three, the bride and groom are betrothed to each other. Step four, a written document is drawn up known as a ketubah. The betrothal contract is called in Hebrew, a shitri erusin. Step five, the bride must give her consent. Step six, gifts were given to the bride and a cup called the cup of the covenant was shared between the bride and the groom. Step seven, the bride had a mikvah, a water immersion, which is a ritual of cleaning. Step eight, the bridegroom departed, going back to his father's house to prepare the bridal chamber. Step eight, no, I'm sorry, step nine. The bride was consecrated and set apart for a period of time while the bridegroom was away building the house. Step 10, the bridegroom would return with a shout. Behold, the bridegroom comes, and the sound of the ram's horn, the shofar, would be blown. Step 11, he would abduct his bride, usually in the middle of the night, to go to the bridal chamber where the marriage would be consummated. Step 12. Oh, this is full marriage known in Hebrew as Nisuin. And finally, step 12. There will be a marriage supper for all the guests invited by the father of the bride. On the wedding day, the bridegroom is seen as a king and the bride as a queen. During the consummation of the marriage, the bridegroom, Yeshua, will be crowned king over all the earth, and the bride, the believers in Yeshua, the Messiah, will live with him and rule with him forever. The crowning of the king and the marriage can be seen in Isaiah chapter 62, verse 3 through 7. The unbelievers in the Messiah will attend a separate banquet where the fowls of the air will eat their flesh. This can be seen in Revelation chapter 19, 17 through 18. In concluding this section on the wedding, 
Whenever anyone hears the message of the, bas the basar, the gospel, it is a wedding proposal by God to accept him and be a part of his bride. God desires that we accept his invitation and give him our response of, I do. In fact, Revelation chapter 22, verse 17 and verse 20 is a proposal by Yeshua himself to accept him and be a part of his bride. His message in this verse is come. Will you say I do to the Messiah proposal to you? Revelation 22 and 17. And the spirit and the bride say come. And let him that heareth say come. And let him that a thirst come. And whoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Revelation 22 and 20. He which testifies these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Yeshua. Amen. Shalom. Amen. Amen. All right. Now we get in. Oh. Uh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I was going to have to jump up. All right, now we're going to get into our Seder, which is great. Before we do that, I need everyone at each table to assign one person to pour the wine on each table, and you choose which wine you want. There is also non-alcoholic for the kids. I see you grinning over there. No, there's non-alcoholic for the kids, okay? <laughs> All right, or anyone who does not drink, okay, um, alcohol. So choose a wine uh, right now, okay? And be before you do that, actually... Uh, Brad, if you could look at, say, for example, this table. Our theme starting with Pesach was bringing Torah to the nations. So every table has a wine from Israel. And Ed, hold that up so that, uh, that they can see it. That's a wine. And look at it. Tell them what region that's from, if you can read that. That's a Merlot, I think it is. Okay. Has... Leo. Okay, Leo is okay Leo. all right, very good. And there's another wine there, I think, from the region of Dan, okay, also. The, uh, uh, the other Israel wine is from Dan. And Jacob's Creek, where is that from, Marcia? Is that from uh, Australia? I'm not sure. Yes, it is. Okay, from Australia. So you have wines from Israel, different regions in Israel, and then Australia. Over on this uh, table, we have another, you know, uh, bark and wine. Okay, this one is from Adulam, Israel, region in Israel. And then we have a wine that is from, um, I'm sorry, okay, that is from France, <laughs> a product of France. Okay, and then over on my table, all right, on my table we have Hope Estate, and this one is from Australia, Western Australia. I got this one, uh, two Australians. I like this one because it says hope. Okay, on it, it says hope. Then I have one from Sinai. Okay, this is from Israel, and this one is from Sinai. Okay, then I have another one, Canaan. Okay, because that's where we are. And then my, my one of my favorite, Jim, uh, or rather Jam Jar, is from South Africa. Since we're going to Africa, we have South Africa. Now, over on your table, once again, in the back there, we have a wine, of course, from um, Israel. And I'm not sure where uh, Rich or uh, Carl. Portugal. Okay, so from Portugal over there. And then on that last table, I know we have one from uh, one of the regions. Sherry, which region is that from, if you read the label? From Dan, okay. And then I know the other wine is from Germany, if I remember correctly. Okay, that one is uh, correct. Um, Leroy, if you could go behind you, I think you have a wine there. I know one of them is from one region, and I know that one's from New Zealand, if I'm correct. Yeah, New Zealand. Okay, New Zealand. Okay, and then uh, Italy. Okay, and then we have one from uh, Israel. Okay, also. All right, so we have wines from every continent all around the world because what are we doing? We're taking Torah to the nations, okay? Torah to the nations. And I believe every place that these wines are from, uh, one day we're going to travel. So I hope everyone keeps their passports updated, okay, and your shots and everything because we're going to be traveling, okay, to take the Torah to the nations. 
One way that we're going to do that is through our radio station that we uh, are uh, having in Sierra Leone. So everybody pour, go ahead and pour some wine. Okay, I'm going to start reading, but pour whichever wine you want. And Marcia, I specifically got that Merlot for you because I know you don't like, you don't like sweet. I'd have everybody with a sugar fit if it were up to me, okay? Okay. And you can uh, uh, share. Uh, hold on. Uh, use the ones that are open. Okay, that are open. Okay, there, there is a, yeah, the white one. All right. Yes, we believe in the fruit of the vine. All right. Um, while you are doing that, and I'm going to get ready to read. Okay, and uh, uh, read a scripture here. I can find it in Deuteronomy. Eh. Let's go to the Seder. All right, now, a Rosh Hashanah Seder has become our tradition. Typically, okay, uh, those that are Jews don't have a Seder on Rosh Hashanah. They do the Passover Seder. So this is something that is our tradition. And remember, a tradition is something that we can do, you know, to teach. And everything we are doing is to teach the children. It's always about teaching the children, all right? So... This Seder was created to welcome the new year, and it's a template to be celebrated, enjoyed, and you can adapt it any way your family wants. The whole thing that we do is so that you can begin to do these things in your home and establish your own family traditions around the feast days. Okay, so this was a, a really neat format that I saw. So I'm going to read, okay, here, okay, so that everybody can follow along. All right, and it's so wonderful to try to look cute, but when your feet hurt, you can't look cute, so we take off the shoes, all right? Ever since the first breath of creation, time has unfolded in cycles of seven. It's important you understand that, because when I counsel someone and they're going through something, I'm gonna ask specific questions, like how long has this thing been going on? Where were you seven years ago? Where were you a year ago? Were you better or worse? Because that's going to tell what direction that cycle is going in. So if we're in a cycle of seven and things are going down, the next three years can be very devastating, okay, if you don't change that cycle, okay? We know the Shemitah year is in cycles of seven. That means if you miss the Shemitah year, how long will you have before you get that year again? Seven years. Seven years is a long time to be going through a particular cycle. We have what seed time and harvest. So that's a yearly cycle. We have a weekly cycle. You understand what I'm saying? All right. A monthly cycle. Okay. So it's very important that everyone get on God's timetable. If you're praying to God for him to do something, he does not do it in your time frame. Things happen in his time frame. So that is why it is important for you to know the timing of the Lord. Now continue reading. Six days reach their crescendo in the seventh day, Shabbat, the Sabbath, the day of rest. Six years reach their crescendo in the seventh year, the Shemitah, the sabbatical, the year of renewal. Seven cycles of seven years reach their crescendo in the Jubilee year the ultimate enactment of recreation. We are currently starting the fifth year of a seven-year cycle. The next Shemitah year is 5782, which will begin on September 7th, 2021. Now, I want to go for a moment just to show you something from Leviticus. I think it is chapter 25. Leviticus chapter 25. All right, so we're in the fifth year, fifth, not two hands, fifth year, okay, of a cycle. All right, it's very important that you understand what you need to start doing right now, okay? I'm going to read in Leviticus chapter 25, 
going to um, verse number 20. And if ye shall say, what shall we eat in the seventh year? Behold, we shall not sow or gather in our increase. Then I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year. And shall bring forth fruit for three years. And ye shall sow the eighth year and eat of the old fruit until the ninth year until her fruits come in ye shall eat of the old store so let me ask you something what if you don't have anything to put in the ground on the sixth year what are you going to get on the sixth year nothing from nothing means nothing you understand what i'm saying because the second year uh, the seventh year is not a year that you sow it's whatever is there is what you get for the next three years. Do you understand what I'm saying? I see people go into lack and despair because they don't understand God's timing. The one thing that he said in Genesis after the flood, as long as the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, winter and summer, there are hard coded seasons. Okay, of production, okay, sowing your seed and reaping your seed. Now, the one thing to understand about Leviticus 25 is that Leviticus 25 is spoken out of the mouth of God, the creator. So therefore, the heavens and the earth are pre-programmed with instructions on how to deal with you. Let that sink in for a minute. You understand what I'm saying? So Yahweh has said, I will ordain the blessing in the sixth year that will feed you for three years. All right? You can wish, hope, sing, pray. Okay, all you want sometimes. But there are some times when you go into lack and you have to depend upon people to do certain things for you. It's because you missed your cycle. You missed your cycle. Okay, and so it's important to understand we are in the fifth year. We're beginning the fifth year of that cycle. So guess what you should be doing this year? Oh, I'm gathering, I'm gathering, I'm gathering, I'm gathering, because what I put in the ground on the sixth year is going to do what? He is going to multiply it. So what do I want to do? I want to have something for God to work with. Woo, another tall one. <laughs> Oh, yes, love the hair, okay? <laughs> Hallelujah. All right, so we want to have something to work with, for God to work with. Put something in his hand to work with. Otherwise, all you get for three-year cycle is charity. Come on. All you get is charity. All right? Okay, so it's important for you to understand that because I see the cycles with people all the time. And we're praying and fast about this. Fast, man, man, no, give me a chicken wing because I know how this thing is going to go, go down. Okay, you see, there's sometimes when you fast and pray, fast and pray. Okay, come on. How many of us have fasted and prayed and nothing happened and we were trying to figure out why? Come on, we've all been there. But the Bible gives you explanations. So we all are in agreement, according to this time frame, it is the fifth year of a seventh year cycle. So we are going to do as much as we can do. Now, here's a, a clue. You want to have twice as much? Ask God to redeem the time. Because I will restore the years. You understand what I'm saying? I'm lazy for the past, okay, four years. Now it's the fifth year. I don't have anything to work with. God, repent, because this is a season of what? Between the next couple of days, repentance, and ask God, okay, to show you what it is. Ask for an instruction. In these next days, you need to be for an instruction on where are the opportunities for you. Here's a clue. My famous saying, okay, is wherever there is chaos, there is opportunity. Look for areas of chaos. There is an opportunity in that for you. And you ask God to redeem the time. So let's continue reading. All three cycles call forth nostalgic images of Eden when humanity lived in abundance, peace, equity, and ease. All offer a way of partial return. But there are differences among them. 
Jubilee is more fantasy than experience, more vision than practice. And while it remains part of our sacred narrative, it has nonetheless fallen out of our sacred calendar. One of the reasons for that is that they say Jubilee can only be celebrated once all of the tribes return to Israel the way it was in the beginning. All the tribes aren't there. Most of the people are where? Outside of Israel. Okay, so any jubilees that are so-called celebrated are based upon man's reckoning a lot of times of time and not God's reckoning of time. Jubilee is when all debts get canceled. Who glory. Okay, <laughs> can you imagine jubilee and you get a letter from Wells Fargo, your mortgage has been canceled. Okay, come on. Okay, things that were lost are returned. It's a time of restoration. And see, these are things that you should begin to look for and expect. Sometimes you wonder why you get a special blessing during a certain time. It's a time of restoration. You understand what I'm saying? If you start working with his timing, you can start capitalizing on his timing. All right, now Shabbat, on the other hand, is a constant presence. It is celebrated weekly as time apart, 25 hours of a lived dream dimension. We enter Shabbat by leaving the work, work a day world and cross into a domain that is Edenic, a taste of the world to come. We are at leisure, eat well, avoid strife, and pretend to create one world, diminishing boundaries that daily divide us. Shemitah sits in these two neither a fantasy nor a constant presence. It is both a vision of a new reality and a practice to be lived in here and now. It happens in the same time and space as all other years, only we are to live this year differently, more equitably, more fully, more intentionally than the six years before. It is a year of harmony and celebration with the earth when the Israel rests with the agricultural labors imposed upon her, yet, when she yields sufficient goodness for us all to thrive. It is a year of commonplace manna. So what does Shemitah represent? It reminds you of manna in the wilderness when God provided for his people. When food is ours for the taking, but modestly, temperately, with a deep sense of gratitude and awareness, when debts are forgiven and there is equity for all, when prosperity what rather when property boundaries are suspended and all becomes once again part of the commons. It is in short a year of rebooting, recalibration, and realigning our assumptions about property, land use, economic justice, social equity, not as a dream, but as a reality. You are aware that this is how our society is supposed to work. Okay, it's how it was supposed to work. Rosh Hashanah 2021 marks the next Shemitah year, the Hebrew year 5782. Hebrews around the world are seeking ways to enter into the laws and spirit of this sabbatical cycle as they have never done before. They are extending its message beyond the boundaries of Israel to wherever they live and extending the thrust of its ethnic ethic beyond the agricultural sector. To mark this moment, to help us begin this historic revisioning, renewal, and re-imaging of the ways to live the cycles of Shemitah, we offer this Rosh Hashanah Seder. It is modeled on the Hebrew tradition of New Year's Simanim, symbolic foods like the traditional apples dipped in honey that represent the blessing we hope will be ours. The Seder consists of six small cups or bowls arrayed on a decorative base plate. This plate, basic, rather, I'm sorry, this base plate represents the whole, the sweep of time, the sphere that encompasses and defines every seven year cycle. For Shemitah is not just one segregated year, as Shabbat is not one segregated day, they are both cycles of time. It is the year that frames and gives shape to all the other years. attributes, essence of the cycle of Shemitah, the Shemitah year, and a life lived in goodness, striving and delight, sacred striving and delight. Slices of apple and other perennial delicacies of your choice are arrayed in the center of the base plate. I don't know if, uh, if 
anyone can see this on Facebook. Let me move these over and bring this forward a little bit. So we'll have pictures also on Facebook. Okay, and uh, these were called the fruit of Eden that sustained us and the tree of knowledge that launched us on the irresistible human enterprise of curiosity, desire, exploration, and pursuits. And they represent the perennial foods, fruit, nuts, and berries that grow on their own during the Shemitah year and that we gratefully eat at a time when we do not plow, sow, reap, or commercially harvest to produce the field. Okay, I'm going to say the blessing, all of us together. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who has kept us alive, sustained us, and has brought us to this season, and who has given us holidays, customs, and seasons of happiness and joy for the glory of our Adonai, Yeshua HaMashiach, the light of the world. Hallelujah. All right. All right, there is um, bread on the table. I'd like everybody to take a piece of the bread, please. The challah bread with raisins. Okay. We're going to say the blessing over the uh, bread and also the wine. All right, let me know when everybody is ready. Okay, I'll do them in Hebrew and then we can all do them in um, English. Brukata a Baruch atah Yahweh Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lekem min haaretz. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth the bread from the earth and has become our Yeshua, the living bread from heaven. In English, let's do the fruit of the vine. Blessed are you, Yahweh, our Elohim, King of the universe, who brings forth the fruit of the vine. All right. All right, cup number one. Honey, representing sova, enoughness. Oh, wouldn't that be nice? You go to your boss, well, here's a $50. Oh, look, I have enoughness. <laughs> Isn't that a novel thought? I have more than, but what, don't we sing that song? Jehovah Jireh, he's more than enough. Okay, enoughness. Sova is the feeling of Fullness without being stuffed. Of contentment through what was given and not wanting anything more. Of maximum satisfaction with minimum consumption and disruption. This first cup is filled with honey. Pass around the cup for all to dip the apples in the honey. All right, there are packets of apples. Everybody just take one apple out of there. There are red apples and there are green apples. So you have a choice. All right. And in the cups while you're doing that, we have grapes. Remember the grapes representing the uh, bunches of grapes that they brought over, or the spies brought over? These are really big grapes, and they are seeded. They are seeded grapes, okay? We have nuts. Everything on the plate represents a harvest. These are things that are grown in Israel. So we have nuts during this time. We have figs and dates in one of the plates. We have pomegranates. Raisins, look at the size of those raisins. Okay, they're huge raisins, okay? And all of these are things that are grown and represent the harvest. Remember what Yahweh said, I'm bringing you to a land flowing in what? 
Milk and honey, milk and honey. All right, so everybody take and, and dip a little bit of your honey on your apple. Get that done. It's deliciousness. All right, okay, all of us are gonna repeat. Ooh, it's dipping on my hand. All right, this is enoughness. Okay, we're gonna say this uh, little saying in the book. When you're ready, hold up your apple. Let the honey run down your hand. Okay, one, two, three. In this cycle of Shemitah, may we know no hunger, either spiritual or physical. May we be as readily sated with the delights of life as this cup is filled by these drops of honey. You may eat the apple. Nice little dessert. Mm hmm That is a very nice little tasting little dessert. Okay. Cup number two. Wine. All right. Wine. Consider fruit wine, of course. Passion fruit wine from or homemade date wine. We have wines from all over the world. Signifying hodaya, gratefulness. Hodaya is the feeling of gratitude of deep satisfaction and elusive peace with what we have received. Wine is the age-old symbol of celebration and expression of shared gratitude. It takes years for the vineyard to grow and produce grapes and time enough for the wine to ferment. Side, this required steadfastness, peace, stability, and longevity. On nature's side, it requires cool and heat and sun and rain and rich soil all in the right amounts. Surely things to be grateful for. This cup is filled to the rim with wine. Wine cups, okay, may be filled too. Everyone hold up your wine cup and let's repeat together. Ready? In this Shemitah cycle, may we know peace and be strangers to disappointment and disruption. May the earth find renewal amidst its rest. And may gratitude fill us all as the wine fills this cup. All right? In my belly. <laughs> okay. Delicious. Cup number three. We have figs. You know what figs look like. Okay, they're these things right here. Okay, everybody get a fig. I love figs. I used to tell my kids when they were little that these things were candy. They thought candy grew on trees. <laughs> they didn't you know, think that a Snickers bar was candy. That's not candy. Raisins and things, grapes and all of that, that was candy to them. I guess that was the first lie I told my kids, you know. But, you know, they only know what you tell them. It would be good for you to grow up, okay, with these. Remember, these figs have seeds, okay, lots of seeds in them too. Okay, cup number three. Figs representing Rivaya, which is abundance. Rivaya is the awareness of the vast resources of a healthy world, the earth's ancient capacity of growth and self-renewal, and our call to keep it going. Figs are not like most other fruit crops. The fruit on one tree do not ripen all at once, but one by one, each in its own time. They offer abundance without surfeit. This cup is filled with figs. We either have, we have the whole and uh, they're dried, speckled and spangled with seeds. Okay, everyone passed around the cup. You have your fig. Let's say this all together. In this cycle of Shemitah, May we recognize abundance and know no waste. May we celebrate the vast goodness that lies within even the most modest cash of life. May we reverently receive life's abundance and the light, the continuous fruiting of the fig tree. Give what we can and at the time that is right. Take a bite of the fig. Our next is raisins. Everybody pass around the raisins. And Brad, remind me the next time they have this rug here for the stores. 
really hard. Ah, raisins, 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 big raisins. Raisins representing Hesed. What is Hesed? Goodness, kindness, generosity. Hesed is a response to our gratitude for the varieties of gifts we have received in this world. Having received a gift to give, such is the nature of the gift. The raisins heaped in this cup signify the sweet, satisfying substance that be can be given even after other extractions of goodness have been taken. They recall the leaves, the juices, the wine, the vinegar, the shade, the wood, and delight that are all gifts of the great. In response to all that we have been given, we are moved to give more. All right. From the raisins, all of us together say, in this Shemitah cycle, may we, receive, may we recognize the gifts we have received and in return realize the manifold ways of giving that lies within each of us. You can eat the raisins. All right, the next is pomegranate. Okay, pomegranate. You might want to put spoons of the uh, spoon of pomegranate upon your uh, plate. On your hand or whichever. All right, just about ready. Pomegranate, pomegranate representing Poriot, fertility. Poriot is the creativity, the dynamism, the fecundity that characterizes the ma majesty of nature. It is what allows us to eat during this year of fallowness and renewal. It is the dormancy that burst forth in the right conditions, inspiring the human gifts of imagination, discovery, and awe. This cup is filled with pomegranate seeds, symbols of overflowing fertility. All right, when I say overflowing fertility, that can be ideas, that can be even with your businesses, that can be in many different ways. In understand what I'm saying? Okay, let's see. Okay, in this uh, particular verse, Ready? In this Shemitah cycle, may we know no barrenness, no emptiness. May this year of material enoughness, delight, and spiritual bounty. All right, eat the pomegranate. I like pomegranate. Okay. Cup number six is dates. The dates are with the uh, figs. So you can take a date. Have a date. It's been a while since I've dated. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> Have a date. All right. Dates representing Ozar, the commons. Otsar is the earth's shared resources, owned by none and gifted to all. It is the storehouse of the ages, the fundamentals of life that we all depend upon. It is the stuff of earth and society, natural and cultural, that we share now in our lifetimes and leave behind for others. Our stories, our knowledge, our goods, our homes, our earth. This cup holds stuff dates signifying all that we share in the giving to and taking from the commons. Okay, let's see here. Hold on. Everyone has a date? All this does is give you different options. Okay, let's everyone take a date and we're all going to say, in this Shemitah cycle, may we know no isolation, no loneliness, no selfishness, May we recognize that we are joined in partnership to the earth and to one another through our common heritage, the Torah, our past and our future that binds us to one another forever throughout the cycles of space and time. 
all right? Uh, eat the date, and then you can uh, wash it down with some, with some wine. All right, Lakayam. It's reading on the back, okay. This multi-layered Seder is a tradition that can be adapted to mark every year of the Shemitah cycle. On Rosh Hashanah of the Shemitah year, the seventh culminating year, all the cups are filled, celebrating the completeness of one Shemitah cycle. The following year, the first year, only the first cup with the honey and the apple. So you can do it one cup at a time. We're doing them all. Okay, we want it all. Okay, second year, the first two cups, third year, and so forth. Okay, and then upon completing of the cycle and celebrating of the next Shemitah year. Look, we are in the kingdom. We are already in our future. God has, what did he say? I will restore the years. Okay, so each of these reminds us of why we are grateful to God. But look at all the prayers that we said and what they actually mean. God's goodness, God's prosperity, all of that. What a remembrance. Okay, each year we get to remember in Passover that we are delivered, that we are redeemed, that we've been saved by the hand of God. And in Rosh Hashanah, we celebrate his goodness, his mercy, okay, towards us. The bounty and the prosperity that he guarantees to us. Who wouldn't want this kind of lifestyle to constantly remember where God remembers us and we remember him? Remember, we said the earth is pre programmed. So the heavens and the earth are witnesses. What did our last Torah portion say? I call heaven and earth to witness. So they are witnesses. Look at, look at Hebrew Institute. Ooh, child, I like Marcia's dress. No, okay. <laughs> Okay, look, look at all of this and how they are celebrating you, God. Even the angels rejoice. There's only one angel that may have a little attitude. Okay, slight attitude. Okay, and he won't get over it, so don't try to please him. You know, we do this because we know who our God is. Come on. And what's even better, it's not so much we know who our God is, but our God knows who we are. And that's what this is about. As a memorial, the trumpets remind God of us as well as us reminding ourselves of him and his goodness and mercy. It is a call to attention where even the heavens and the earth are all called to attention. And when we celebrate the way that we do, once again, God says, if you obey my commandments, these blessings will run you down overtake you so that you walk in the path of blessings of blessings so we end this okay and this is a good study all right that you can give to other people also to show them the scriptural background for all of this all right and and remember this is something a format that you can if we ever get to the point where we aren't doing it here because we're spread out all over the earth uh, you know giving the torah imagine if you were in different places doing exactly the same thing you understand what i'm saying especially to those who don't know him all right this is such of a witness okay and in a very non-threatening way to introduce the feast days and when i say feast god knows how to throw a party okay the tabernacles, we're getting ready to party for a week. Okay, Passover, we party for a week. This day, you know, one day wasn't good enough. We need two days. Okay, the only day I'm good is one day is Yom Kippur. Okay, yeah. Yom Kippur, I'm glad that's just one day. Okay, just one day of that. Okay, because Ed would faint if he had to fast for two days. Okay, just kidding, Ed. Okay, so we're going to end this with this high, go to the first page, cover sheet. And everybody stand. And Cindy, if I could get you to blow that shofar. And then we are going to say the Adonai Hu Ha Elohim to that. Okay, blow the shofar. Uh. Woo! Adonai. 
Adonai, who ha Elohim. 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 The Lord, He is God. 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 Yeshua is our 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 God. Hallelujah. 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 Well, that ends our Seder, but it is just the beginning of our celebration because just like true Hebrews, we love to eat after a service, okay? So for Facebook, our Facebook family, I want to thank you. Those who are online, I want to thank you. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Jenny, if you can end the recording. Okay, we're going to go ahead and end the Facebook. Okay, also, guys, thank you very much. Okay, drop us a line. I'll get back to you. Uh, hold on. Did you already end it? Okay, if you want to speak to me directly, please email me at charlotteisrael at gmail.com. Charlotteisrael at gmail.com. If you want to get on our mailing list, okay, we will email okay, our lessons to you. We'll email our services to you. Also, you can listen to us on Live 365. That's www.live, L-I-V-E, 365.com and search for Hebrew Institute. So everyone have an awesome Leshana Tova, okay? And have a wonderful holiday. We'll meet again on Yom Kippur, which is on the 9th of October at 10 a.m. Blessings to you, blessings to your family. May Yahweh bless you and keep you. May Yahweh lift his face upon you, okay? <laughs> Be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom. I'm used to saying it in Hebrew first and then English, okay? All right? So shalom, shalom. Blessings to you. All right. Give that a hand clap.